My pleasure to introduce Jennifer Tim. Uh, Jenny is an Enigma postdoc uh, who's been with us, uh, I think, since the beginning of 2020. Uh, she has a PhD in chemistry from uh, University of York, where she did protein structure function work. Um, and her previous postdoc before joining us was with uh, Celia Schiffer at UMass Medical School, uh, looking at the mechanism of action of HCV protease inhibitors, that's hepatitis C virus. Uh, so, you know, it's great having Jennifer on the team. She brings a uh, deep knowledge of molecular biology and metalloprotein chemistry and has been working on a very interesting project today uh, that she's going to talk about today uh, on the design and characterization of a primordial uh, nickel peptide hydrogenase. And so, Jenny, it's yours. Hello, my name is Jennifer Tim and I'm a postdoc at Rutgers University and work on the reconstruction of a potential primordial hydrogenase. Now, early Earth was a very different place from today, and it had generally a lot more reducing conditions than what we observe here. It is high in CO2 and hydrogen gas in the atmosphere, and early life emerged under those really different conditions. They will have to deal with very different energy and carbon sources than are available today, and also the elements they could use for performing this catalysis were um, very different from now. So in very early Earth, we had this transition where we had primarily um, minerals, and then all of a sudden, very, very complex bio biomolecular machines emerged. But obviously, these bi complex proteins that are composed on, of a lot of amino acids chained together into peptides and then folded into complex proteins, they must have been a lot um, simpler and smaller than they are now, now, really. So there must have been a stage where small peptides were binding metallic cofactors and did all the reactions that were essential for life. One of those very ancient essential enzymes was hydrogenase. There are three different hydrogenases, depending on what kind of active site we are talking about, but all of them have one thing in common, and that is that they are um, composed of multiple subunits and hundreds and hundreds of amino acids uh, with multiple cofactors. Um, all of them catalyze the reversible oxidation of molecular hydrogen, which is then used to provide energy. And still nowadays, this is an essential enzyme for anaerobic organisms. Now, while it is very, very big and complicated, if you are looking at the active site where the catalysis happens, it is composed of two metal ions, one nickel and one iron, which are coordinated by the peptide environment. Now, the idea is that the catalytic function it resides only in the nickel ion, while the iron ion is more of a regulatory component. Now, we did a lot of in silico evolution um, of metal binding sites without using any homology restraints, and then um, screened quite a lot of peptides just in vitro for their properties. Um, the peptide I'm going to talk to you about today is actually a 13 amino acid, instead of hundreds, 13 amino acids long. And we could show that it is, an, in fact, binding nickel. When we're using circular dichroism, in nickel titrations, we can see that the, our peptide undergoes a complex maturation process with multiple intermediates, but it always equilibrates at a nickel uh, to peptide ratio of one, two to one. So two nickel ions for each peptide. Uh, if we are trying to figure out whether it transfers electrons, we are indeed looking at um, uh, the, the capability in uh, circular voltammetry, um, which is this plot here uh, to the to the right. Now, um, what we can show is that the intermediates that go through are not active at all, but indeed the final mature species is indeed capable of transferring electrons. Now we have a, a computational model, and we know it is binding nickel, but ultimately how it looks like and how the geometries look like has to be addressed experimentally. For this, we are using um, 
electron paramagnetic resonance or EPR. In order to see nickel at EPR, we are uh, we need to reduce it to nickel one or oxidize it to nickel three. If we are indeed um, reducing the complex or, uh, to nickel one using europium DPTA um, and complex it with bicarbonate, what we can see is that um, the EPR spectrum is very, very characteristic. And looking through the literature, what you can see is that the um, EPR spectrum looks identical to, to the EPR spectrum obtained for uh, acetyl-CoA synthase. Now, acetyl-CoA synthase is a very different enzyme to hydrogenase, but it is equally as essential, if not more so, and it's very, very complex and ancient as well. Indeed, um, acetyl-CoA synthase, or ACS, has two nickel in the active site in the vicinity of the 4 iron 4 sulfur cluster. Again, our EPR uh, uh, signal seems to be stemming from only one of the two nickel um, clusters, which is also the situation for us. We only see one nickel at a time. And it seems indeed to have a very similar binding geometry to the one in ACS. Now, if we are oxidizing our complex, um, we are seeing a, co a completely different signal, um, but also a different coordination. So anal analyzing it with um, pulse DPR, we can see that both of those are not the same nickel at all. Um, indeed, if we are then adding imidazole to the solution, it all of a sudden causes an EPR signal that looks like nickel superoxide dismutase. The superoxide dismutase, SOD, has a very similar coordination to our nickel site um, that we think we address, plus an additional uh, histidine that is coordinating it, which is very similar to what we see when we're adding imidazole, which is a very similar molecule. Now, again, SOD is a very, very different uh, type of enzyme, but again, also very ancient, and it is very essential for life. So while it is interesting to see these um, homologies to other enzymes, we were out trying to design hydrogenase. And indeed, when we give it our complex electrons uh, from a photosensitive dye, our complex uses those electrons and makes hydrogen gas, which is incredibly exciting. And we can see that it does that not only once, but over 500 times. Um, which is quite impressive for such a small molecule. Now, in summary, it's actually pretty exciting to see that the reaction performed by such a very complex enzyme that we have today in life, it can also be performed by such a simple and uh, small peptide complex. Indeed, we can see that the active site coordination might even be similar to other very ancient enzymes and it, while it is still capable of making hydrogen gas. Now, this is just leaving us with a lot of potential avenues to f go further in the study, namely further structural characterization to make sure we are getting as accurate param parameters as possible for further simulations, but also we can now look what kind of other reactions could possibly be catalyzed. Why stop at hydrogenase and hydrogen production if you be potentially have a real generalist on our hands? And now it opens the doors to go very deep into the potential cat uh, catalytic mechanism of this enzyme and others to look really what is essential to perform a certain reaction. And at this stage, I would love to thank you for your attention. I would want to thank my uh, wonderful advisors and colleagues that helped uh, with this project. And please, if you have any further questions, don't hesitate to contact me. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Jenny. Um, that was a great talk. We, we can take questions for Jenny now, if you like.
Uh, any questions for Jenny? So I'm going to ask you a simple question. So you have, I think, a 10 or 11 amino acids? Yes. And two nickels. That's it? Yes. Pretty and, much. And you can draw the hydrogenase. Yeah. So um, if I was to turn this around to Marcus now or to Dennis, what would it take to make a nitrogenase? So the hydrogenase reaction is handling about two electrons at a time um, for a reaction. One at a time. One at a time. One at a time, but sequentially. Yeah. I'm not sure four electrons would be just as easy. I mean, so certainly worth a try. Um, and I would totally be up for sending, sending you a sample. Um, but we were just discussing that actually earlier here in the office, like, how about we do this? Um, so uh, the other option would be to try and play with the metal identity in there. Um, that's an obvious choice as well. But um, it should be working. It seems to be quite similar in, in onset potential um, if you compare that to the data in the, in the previous talk. Um, could be working. Well, we don't have nickel nitrogenases, but... Yet. <laughs> this one might be one. Marcus, you have any thoughts? Well, I think it's, I mean, like the, the mechanism of nitrogenase is so super complicated for N2 reduction, right? I think it's, I mean, it's even fairly difficult to, spec allow, to speculate about this, uh, I would say. Yeah, I think the, I mean, yeah. substrate binding is the question, right? Like where do, how do you trap the, the nitrogen on it in a specific way so you can manipulate um, protonate it basically? Well, that's what I was asking Dennis about. So basically, you have a, a an inert gas uh, that needs to be, you need to donate electrons to it. I mean, at some point, I don't care if you make hydrazine. It it just reducing the N two is 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 how do you do it right? So. Me one of but, see, I mean, it's, I think there are also, in fact, the thing is this, I think there's still too many unknown factors because what is also very puzzling that these isolated clusters, for example, which we're working with, the carbon monoxide and cyanide reduction to hydrocarbons and carbon-carbon coupling, they can do fairly easy. In fact, okay, easy. In fact, this is really, we have not, for these isolated clusters, there's absolutely no evidence for the isolated clusters that they can do in N2 reduction or any other. So I think that, I mean, it is just, this is probably what is the protein environment for, right? I mean, it is just, the, 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 the nitrogenase is just tuned for the N2 reduction, which is an endlessly, endlessly complex problem. So I'm not quite sure if you, if you want to, if you know how to put this into words, but to simplify the system to two iron atoms, I think it's, I mean, if there, I mean, there's additional, the additional conformational changes required. You have the eye topping of the iron protein to the movie protein, right? Which you need to shuffle the electrons over there. And I mean, it's, I think it is, I guess during evolution, nitrogen has evolved this complex system. So I'm not sure how easy it would be to make such a simple, a simplified system. Right. I mean, I don't know if this answers the question. Uh, I mean, what really. we what we know is um, that we can bind cyanide as well as carbon carbon carbonate or carbon dioxide. That's still the question. But we can bind carbonate and uh, cyanide probably at the distal nickel at the amide coordinated one. So we can bind bind that, and it will slow down the enzyme, just not. It will, it will not inhibit it. So it, it was the only way we can basically trap it uh, for EPR. Um, so it does slow it down to a certain extent. Um, what 
we also suspect actually, so from data I didn't show, is that um, one of, at least one of the protons um, in the reaction possibly comes from one of the cysteines, ligating cysteines. So if that is indeed true, then we at least know the source of one of them. So I'm not entirely sure at what site you would find nitro nitrogen, um, what sites are available um, to it or conducive to it. But um, there are plenty of potential sites. Um, the, so yeah, specific, probably not, but. Can I, can I make a couple of comments? Um, so there are model compounds such that, that uh, Jonas Peters and, and um, Pat Holland have made that will reduce N2 catalytically on a metal site. So that, there's, that is one thing to consider. But from the perspective of nitrogenase, really there's three different kinds of reactions that, it, that it's catalyzing. One is protonolysis. Another is carbon-carbon coupling that Mark has talked about. And the other is the proposed um, reductive elimination reaction. And those are pretty, all I think a little bit different. And so you've got to worry about the competing reactions. And that's what the exquisite nature of nitrogenase does is it favors, in my opinion, under the correct conditions, um, reductive elimination rather than protonolysis. But that's, that's, as Marcus Wells know, knows, is an experimentalist in this, in this field. It's really tough uh, to get this system uh, to work the way nature, <laughs> nature wants it to work. Um, or nature's designed it to work. And it is, it is truly complicated. Yeah. So be, you know, it's in fact also true, right? And also if you think about it, I mean, there's even industrial process, the Harvard Bosch, right? Where you have your catalyst where then two reduction occurs at massive pressure or temperatures, right? So I think it's it's really difficult to say basically. So I guess also what are you aiming to if you want to have this really on the on the more ambient physiological conditions, right? It's just super difficult, even if you use some model compounds, right? Because then you have this insolvent, you have this, I mean, it's, it makes matter. If you really want to mimic the, the nitrogenous system in a simplified way, I think it will be extremely, it, it will be extremely complicated. Because if you look at the structures, right, if you bind the substrate on there, it also seems like the sulfur comes off, off. So maybe there's a sulfur replacement involved. So how do you account for this, right? That's just, I think there are too many unclear factors still, I would say. So if I, I think the counter argument to the, it is too complex, you know, how could we ever do something like this, is that nitrogenase must have had a predecessor, which was simpler. <coughs> which was even simpler at some point there had to be something that was a, a generalist that you know took on this you know nitrogen fixation reaction and maybe you know physiological conditions now require you know a much more complex enzyme just like rubisco as rose was talking about yesterday you know has to figure out how to deal with both oxygen and carbon dioxide now but in the early earth oxygen wasn't no. i wonder if there's something about early earth conditions that made the evolvability of a simpler nitrogenase easier. And, and like um, what, what this project is, is aiming to is kind of trying to look back in time how, how it could have started to get catalytic biological catalysis going in the first place. So it's not as it's at that stage, if we are talking about a potential general, generalist as a starting point, the efficiency and how often it gets distracted by other side reactions is is kind of expected and but secondary. It's like it, as long as it does the reaction, it, it could have gone from there, I guess. Um, the, that's the idea. See, the thing which I also what we have been really thinking about is also um, maybe the more ancient nitrogenase was evolved for different function. Yes, and then the, sure. the, the complexity got added, the complexity got added during the tuning to the N2 reduction. So maybe this is the thing, right? Maybe you will not find a simpler nitrogen is which really does N2 reduction. Maybe it does something different, right? Which I think is very likely, to be honest. I mean, I wouldn't exclude this. This is, oh. this is the, but I mean, sort of what, it's actually a quite intriguing question, right? What level of complexity had to be added to make the system work? 
right? Where's the switch point? It's actually a great question. Well, let's take a look at it. So um, you have basically a series of ferrodoxins that are coupled, right? I mean, when you take a look at it, you're, you're, you're ferrying electrons through a ferrodoxin to the iron protein that is ferrying the electrons again. So you're, you have a bunch of ferrodoxins effectively built up into Rossman folds. Uh -huh. Um, so let's reverse engineer the problem. So, you know, biology didn't have a selection pressure for nitrogen fixation per se. It had to have been a chance that an enzyme made nitrogen available <coughs> that biology at that point could use. Because there were bunches and bunches of amino acids in the ocean delivered by meteorites. At some point within not even a million years, you would have used those up in biology. Um, you needed to then have a nitrogen fixing process. Carbon fixation is trivial. We have many reactions that can fix carbon. Um, sulfate, uh, was not around, so you had reduced sulfur compounds, so you had all kinds of possibilities for using sulfur in amino acids, of which there are only two. Um, and none of those are in meteorites, I would say. So methionine and cysteine are not in meteorites. It's, it's not in a meteorite. So you needed to have some very simple mechanisms to get you to pathways that gave you at least on order of 12 to 15 amino acids, not the full 20. We, we, we got the full 20 much later. Um, but certain amino acids required nitrogen fixation very early on. And we have, I think, pretty good evidence in the geologic record that nitrogen fixation occurred at least about 3.8 billion years ago. One, I mean, the nitrogen isotopic composition of uh, organic matter, and it has to be really organic matter, not just bulk, of, of kerogens in the organic matter at 3.8 is about zero, which is very consistent with the nitrogen isotopic composition of nitrogen fixation. Um, it's a very interesting problem, Marcus. I mean, you're, you're sitting, I know, you know, I understand the biochemists are isolated from the geochemists, uh, which is fascinating to me. <laughs> but at the end of the day, I mean, it's, it's a very interesting problem of how we got these very, very important processes, which are singular events. So we don't have 20, 25 different nitrogen fixing reactions on the planet. Mm -hmm. You have three and they're all basically the same variant of each other. So there had to have been a very, very early selection of these mm -hmm. and Yes, it, you know, it's fascinating. We have, for the last 2.35 billion years, we've had oxygen on the planet and we've never had an oxygen resistant nitrogenase. So nitrogenase has always been protected from oxygen. Um, Dennis, I mean, you must have thought about this for a long time because that's why we can't insert these goddamn genes into plants, right? Yeah. Uh, it's enigma is the right word. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if we could, you know, if we could have had a, an oxygen resistant nitrogenase, the world would have been changed. You, you, you know, we wouldn't need. Uh, to, to extract it with high temperatures and, and pressures from the atmosphere. Yeah, but I don't, Paul, I don't think it's impossible to put engineer a plant 
that will be able to fix nitrogen. It's yeah. I think no, it's, I agree. I, it's yeah. not impossible, but uh, it's, it's amazing it's, that we haven't done it. You know, it's also just like looking at um, you know the you know the iron sulfur world that was probably developed before the you know before oxygen and, met and, and metabolism got trapped using paradoxins and iron sulfur clusters when there was probably if it had evolved differently, it would be better ways to, to move electrons around. Mm -hmm. The metabolism got stuck down this path. Right. You're, you're, you, it's right. I mean, that's that's the Dayhoff story. So everything that got uh, evolved early just kept that, that what I call the Microsoft world going. So you just, Microsoft 2022 is just gonna be another 500,000 lines of code that fixes Microsoft you know, 1990 or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. um, we didn't invent a new operating system. Uh, so life began with an operating system, which is very, very, very old and very uh, un, not evolvable, almost unevolvable. So the Dayhoff world would have said any molecule that has to interact with another molecule to create a system of electron transfers or whatever it is, protein synthesis, those become virtually unevolvable. Which is, you know, it's it's um, it's why ribosomes are so incredibly constant through time. Mm -hmm. Uh, so we have all of these, these systems and I, I, I don't know where to go with this because I'm trying, we're not trying to make in, in, in biochemistry and chemistry, you're trying to make a system that will fix nitrogen or do things that are, you know, practical. I'm trying to understand the evolution of them, uh, which is not what we're normally trained for in chemistry and biochemistry. And we're not trained in evolutionary processes. So uh, Vic has done an amazing job, I think, in using structure and sequence to develop uh, an understanding of folds in many proteins and all oxidoreductases. And Yana has also done this very, very well, as you've seen. So we'd like to go back to those very, very simple folds, a Rossman fold, a Ferrodoxin fold, <clears throat> and recreate a very, very simple nitrogenase, maybe something 20 amino acids, one iron sulfur cluster. And so it doesn't work very well. Who cares? Mm -hmm. Um, but that has, has got to have been the way the world started. I mean, What's it? go on. See, the thing is basically what, 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 what we can't help but wonder is that then why, if, if, there, if there is a, sim a simpler nitrogenase, right, which accomplished this easier with an easier system, which does not cost that much effort and energy for the cell to generate. Why did evolution make such a complex system? Well, I what mean, is, what is the end? What is the advantage? This, this is something which I have been thinking, or, or, and I'm sure Dennis and others the same. Why did we sort of the balance point where you say it's for the cell really worth to put so much energy in there to make it better? Wouldn't it be better for the cell to have a simpler system which already works? Well, we only, you know I mean? only how do you look at this? Now what made it, right? We only we only see the winning solution. We didn't see the ones that died. Well, I think a very simple uh, answer is Marcus, you know this. This is what you said, is that this system is promiscuous. Hmm. Okay. So if you mm -hmm. want to fix nitrogen and you know, why not just so this is the, the problem with Rubisco, which, which uh, was Saroj asked yesterday. You know, we could have just fixed oxygen to make nothing. And in fact, it's amazing to me that 30% of the photons absorbed by higher plants 
are generating nothing. Generating a two carbon product, which is respired. Can because, I make a comment here? Is that yeah, we don't we don't know there's not a simpler system. We, we don't know if we haven't looked hard enough. And I, I want to give you a historical perspective. When Paul Bishop first claimed there was a vanadium or an iron only nitrogenase, he was hounded by the chemists. Uh, and he was called all kinds of charlatan, whatever you name, because the chemists were convinced it could only happen on molybdenum. And so it's a matter of, of you know, I don't know if, it, if there's a simpler system that exists or not, but the question is, is anybody looking for it? You know, not in, so Corday gave you an idea that there were nitrogenases all over the place in the world, in microbes, and yet we don't culture, I don't think even 2% probably of those microbes. So, um, I mean, I, I agree. I think I'm, I'm also convinced that there are additional nitrogenases. Because I mean, if you think about how, what's the amount of, 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 ends, of what's the amount of microbes that have been isolated and iron culture, right? right. You, you have this huge pool like of, of mythologies, hyperthermophiles, whatever. I mean, there's such a huge pool out there. And I mean, if you, we know a small percentage of the system, it's also maybe they are simpler. We didn't, it's not even not looking hard enough, it's just because you can't cultivate them, right? I mean, a lot of the microbes failed in the cultivation process, right? To making it grow in, in the laboratory, maybe I agree. So there is a, a new way uh, currently available <laughs> of pulling out nitrogenases that we haven't seen before from metagenomic data, um, or at least the reads that belong to nitrogenases. Um, and then someone would have to actually do the experiment to pull out the complete sequence and uh, determine its functionality. It, it, it's not a simple question in that sense. Even if we find it, then what? I mean, this, that's the thing. We don't even know. Like, I mean, we are looking for homologs of something we know. No, but the okay. machine learning know. allows you to stop looking for homologs. Yes, of course. But um, mm -hmm. we like if we are looking for a nitrogenase that is functioning very, very differently. It might look very, very differently. And we have just no idea what to look for. Yeah, machine learning. That's, that's what I'm trying to say. It's magic. The, the, <laughs> idea, the idea there is that you can use uh, the deep learning systems. Adrian showed this, in, in not with nitrogenases, but with just oxidoreductases. Oh, yeah. okay. well, so another, another thing I want to mention, I'm sure you probably have all seen this paper that appeared in Science not too long ago. Uh, there is a nitrogenase-like enzyme that, that reduces carbon sulfur compounds. Right. Um, and it's real, one of the really exciting things about this is it, it also has, it needs to make the L cluster or nifico, whatever you want to call it. And so there's a great parallel between something that has nothing to do with nitrogen fixation that's enzymologically very, very similar. Very cool. All right, um, so Vic mentioned in a chat, so lightning, yes, lightning can reduce N2 in the presence of CO actually uh, to a oxidized form of nitrogen such as nitrite. The lifetime of those molecules has, is about a few hours. So this has been a mechanism or a thought uh, that has been out there for many years, 